So yeah, my rate uh, really focused on what we know so far about bacteria from a scientific point of view, and I want to go a little bit more into details from a practical winemaking point of view. So of course, for yourself, uh, as a winemaker, you have four important considerations when you talk about malolactic fermentation. Obviously, the first question is, do you want malolactic fermentation in the first place? Uh, is it the style of wine uh, that you want? If you want malolactic fermentation, are you going to inoculate or are you going to wait and hope that it happens spontaneously? If you are going to inoculate, when? Mairead mentioned the two main, co-inoculation and sequential. And then, of course, the big question. If you're going to add bacteria, which bacteria are you going to select and why? So we're going to go through each of these um, a little bit more in detail. Of course, Mairead showed how the style of wine can differ with and without malolactic fermentation. In general, wines without malolactic fermentation tends to be a little bit more fresh, and as you can imagine, you retain some more acidity, so it has a little bit more of a, an acidic mouthfeel, whereas wines with malolactic fermentation, depending on the bacteria and when you add it, you tend to have either more fruity wine styles or more buttery wine styles, but in general, it tends to give you more complex wines. So uh, in, in the majority of especially red wines, it's a preferred uh, process to happen. So once you have made the decision that you do want malolactic fermentation in your wine, the big question is, of course, are you going to inoculate with bacteria or are you going to do a spontaneous malolactic fermentation? So both of these come with pros and cons, of course, um, but in general, spontaneous is a risk. Um, we are lucky enough, both in Spain and South Africa, of course, we have quite, uh, um, quite uh, high um, temperatures, so in general, spontaneous fermentations tend to happen a little bit easier here. But you do, of course, have the risk that the process either happens partially or doesn't even happen at all. So, due to those risks, over the last maybe 20, 30 years, people have really concentrated on finding solutions to make sure that you have a complete malolactic fermentation. So, security is definitely a big, a big aspect. And what we've seen in maybe the last 10 to 15 years, which has become a real focus, is the way malolactic fermentation impacts on the sensory profile of the wine. And we're going to have a look at that as well. Usually I would walk the whole stage, but they told me to stay right here, so I'm very stationary today. So if you look at what a bacteria really likes in, uh, in terms of pH, sulfur, alcohol, etc., etc., and you compare that with what it actually has to endure once you put it into either the juice or the wine, you can see there's quite a difference. Um, and as Marit mentioned, None of these factors operate independently. They all influence each other. Um, as you know, the pH and the sulfur, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can't really look at one factor at a time. You really do have to consider how they interact and how they play a role. And this is really where commercial bacteria cultures have come from, is the fact that this is where they like to work, natural bacteria, but we need them to work at different conditions. So I'm going to run through a list of um, some general, some not so general factors that if you're a winemaker and you would like malolactic fermentation, you have to keep in mind. Some will be quite obvious, some not so much. So the four main parameters, of course, um, here you have some control. I mean, you can measure, you can adjust, um, and you can monitor, but um, you need to be aware of all of them. Something we are seeing, I, I'm not sure if the same is happening in, in Spain, but in South Africa, definitely, um, with the weather patterns changing over time, with climate, climate changes happening, we tend to have some more um, wet summer, so rain later in the season during ripening. And we have seen a real increase in the amount of sprays needed uh, in the vineyard. So here you unfortunately, I know it's difficult, but you have to respect uh, the withholding periods before, before harvest. But it's definitely on the increase and they have a real negative uh, impact on the bacteria.
something maybe more towards the La Mancha area, where you obviously have <laughs> massive tanks. Um, there is an impact on the bacteria. Um, the bigger the tank and the, the more pressure there is um, on the bacteria lees. There's a whole list of factors that come into play once you consider alcoholic fermentation. As Marit mentioned, that interaction between the yeast you choose and the bacteria, you have to make sure that they actually like each other. And if you have a stressful or a difficult alcoholic fermentation, the odds are you're going to have issues with your malolactic fermentation as well. Marit mentioned the malic acid concentration. Uh, you, like us, generally um, have a problem with too low levels of malic acid, um, so that has to be something you measure and you monitor. Of course, the spontaneous bacteria, the indigenous population, what is in your juice coming from the vineyard side, you have to consider. Of course, spoilage organisms can have a negative impact on the, on the bacteria, so if you, if you tend to have some issues with Brettanomyces, um, that could also negatively have an impact on the bacteria. Lees contact, um, Marit mentioned a lot of Chardonnays um, with malolactic fermentation happening in barrel. In general, it seems to be quite stimulatory towards the yeast, uh, towards the bacteria. So, um, in general, it helps them and helps the process. Nutrients, if you read nothing of that paragraph, all you need to remember is that diammonium phosphate, DAP, does nothing for bacteria. So, they prefer organic nitrogen. So, you can add as much DAP as you want. You will not help the bacteria and you will not help with the malolactic fermentation. In more difficult conditions, you have to ensure that you that you have enough organic nitrogen available. Oxygen, we'll have a look at some results with micro-oxygenation in a moment. Overall, it tends to be um, stimulatory and beneficial for them. A question I get a lot is, okay, if we want to do co-inoculation, what happens to my tannin usage for fermentation? So we'll have a look at how some tannins can be beneficial for bacteria, but it's also very strain dependent, um, depending on the bacteria you have. So if we look at some results in microoxygenation, it's actually done in a Tempranillo here in Spain a couple of years ago. So we have the two inoculations, co-inoculation on the left, without and with microoxygenation, and sequential without and with. And you can see the treatment um, with the co-inoculation and the microoxygenation had the best overall result if we look at the color intensity. Um, I know it's a, quite a typical um, practice for you here in Spain. The question, as I mentioned, I get a lot is what happens with the tannins and the bacteria. So you can see we have in co-inoculation two, two types of bacteria products, the one with and without and the other with and without tannins. And in general, we had a positive impact um, using fermentation tannins together with the bacteria during co-inoculation. So this is, of course, going to be dependent on the bacteria. Your uh, bacteria supplier should be able to tell you whether they can um, be used together with tannins or not. And in general, it seems to have a good impact um, on the bacteria. If we look at using tannins and the overall impact on the sensory profile of the wine, you can see on the left a bacteria with and without tannin. Overall, we had a better sensory evaluation, better color intensity, better fruitiness, better spice character, so a very positive impact. The same with a different yeast, um, with a different bacteria product, with and without tannin, overall a better quality wine. So, for many years, um, winemakers are very uh, focused on how they rehydrate their yeast. We would like, ideally, to have the same focus on the bacteria, if possible. Um, so, just some four factors you have to consider is, number one, please don't use tap water. They do not like the chlorine in tap water at all. They're very sensitive to it. Your water temperature, ideally, around about 15 to 18 degrees. You have to remember that as soon as there is not enough substrate available, the bacteria biomass starts decreasing. So when you rehydrate your bacteria, 15 minutes max. 
And then, of course, if, it's a, if you're expecting a more difficult fermentation, you have to consider the nutrition, as I mentioned earlier. So in general, I personally, I like to not call it rehydration of bacteria, because the moment you say rehydration, people think of yeast and the juice and the water and the 45 minutes and the et cetera, et cetera. So I prefer to say uh, the dispersion of bacteria, because ideally it's just so that it mixes well in the tank. It doesn't actually need to grow by mass like the yeast. And here, the final instruction is just really ask your supplier what you're supposed to be doing um, and follow those instructions, then you'll, be, then you'll be better off. So when we come to when to inoculate, Marit mentioned the two main ones, co-inoculation and sequential. We have, um, in the past, had two others, the early inoculation, where it's during alcoholic fermentation, worse results you get with that, and then the delayed inoculation has also been a practice. But for now, probably for the last maybe 10, 15, 20 years, the two main uh, ones have been co-inoculation and sequential. So both, as with the spontaneous and the inoculated, both have positives and negatives. So depending on your situation and the big question Mark Marred had in her presentation, what do you want to achieve? This will influence your decision on going with the one or the other. And in general, tends to be an easier process for the bacteria during co-inoculation, whereas sequential, obviously depending on the wine, tends to be more challenging for them. And you have to be more aware of the nutrition, the temperature, obviously after harvest, things start decreasing, so it's a little bit more challenging for them. And then, of course, the big impact on the sensory profile, fruity, complex versus more buttery style. So here, just to show you the difference um, in sequential and co-inoculation and the impact it has on anthocyanins in this case, in general, the co-inoculation tends to result in higher anthocyanin concentrations after malolactic fermentation. Once again, all strain dependent as well. When you look at just focusing on co-inoculation, but different bacteria cultures, you can see that they also differ in their impact on the color and the anthocyanins. So it's not a given that you will have more or less color. It really depends on the bacteria you select as well. So we have two Unococcus uni on the left, and then Duet is a range of mixed bacteria. Unococcus uni and Lactobacillus plantarum, and you can see the impact choosing a different product has on the, con on the concentration. Marit uh, briefly mentioned the diacetyl, and the main reason you have lower buttery or less buttery characters during uh, co inoculation is that last little step changes the diacetyl, which is very prominently buttery and with a very low perception threshold, to the acetoin and 2,3-butane diol, which are uh, um, compounds that still has some impact on the battery, but a lot less, and they have a very high uh, threshold level, so you need quite a lot before they have an impact. So, in general, uh, much less diacetyl for co-inoculation, much less buttery characters, and, and of course that allows the more fruity characters to come to the, come to the fore. Okay, so what to inoculate, the last thing you have to consider. Um, in the 1980s, quite a number of years ago, it was, as Marit mentioned, let's get the malic to lactic. That was the only consideration for choosing a bacteria. In the last um, maybe 30, 20 years ago, um, we focus still on the kinetics, of course, it must still do the job, malic to lactic, but all the other considerations started adding up. Uh, people started actually measuring their pH, measuring the malic acid, measuring the sulfur before adding bacteria. And then, uh, probably in the, in the last 10, 15 years, the, um, the health uh, implications of uh, malolactic fermentation also started becoming important. If you wanted to export to certain countries, the biogenic amine concentration is important. And so these are all very much strain-dependent characteristics. So your supplier should be able 
to explain to you and tell you whether your bacteria culture will influence any of those parameters. And now, which is actually quite exciting, I think, because I think we're finally reaching a stage where we are thinking about bacteria in the same way as we are thinking about yeast. You select the yeast based on the sensory profile you're going to get at the end of the day. And I think maybe now people are finally starting to understand that you can use bacteria to also influence uh, the sensory profile. So, of course, um, you have all these factors to consider, and you have the consumer on the other end that is wanting a specific wine style, and now you have the perfect tool of um, really selected and very well characterized, so able to explain all those factors on the left. Cultures of, as Marit mentioned, you have pure Unococcus unicultures, pure Lactobacillus cultures, you have blends of these cultures. So there really is a big toolbox available in terms of bacteria. So just as you can see here, really depending on which strain you choose, you can have a very different impact um, on the wine profile. The Duet, lots more of the floral, fruity, monoterpene um, kind of compounds, and the Unococcus in a lot less. Same for sequential. Um, we can choose a culture that has more mature fruit, more spice, um, whereas another culture doesn't. So it really is dependent on you uh, as the winemaker and the style you want. I go fast. I was told to speak very slowly, so sorry. Okay, so you as a winemaker, you really have a responsibility to, to ask certain questions. What is the sensory impact you want from the bacteria you're going to add? And then, of course, you have to make all of these four main decisions we discussed based on what you have to work with. What is the pH of your juice, the sulfur levels, et cetera, et cetera. So really decide what you want, and then you have to understand how the decisions you make in the winemaking process will influence your bacteria to get to that final decision. And manage and monitor is on the list three times because <laughs> people tend to be very focused on managing alcoholic fermentation and they forget about the little bacteria bugs. But you need to also follow the process and make sure you understand what's happening. Okay, and that's me. Muchas gracias.